Hey team, how are you going? Today we're going to be doing something a little bit different than usual. It's sort of an experiment. I'm going to be reviewing or walking through a crate, in this case the Base 64 crate, which is one of Rust's most popular. In fact, if we go and look into the GitHub page, we can see that it has just under, at the time of recording, 350,000 dependents across all of GitHub. And so I have the code locally cloned here, just to pull the, the readme across. I apologize, by the way, I've been quite sick recently and so I'm still kind of recovering. Hopefully you will allow my, you'll forgive my voice and eventually we will get to some place where my voice actually recovers. <laughs> so. A good place to start might be the the readme. Readme is very extensive, and we talk about, and it also has a minimum supported Rust version that's quite old, which is kind of a which is an important part of a library that you have very wide adoption. And there's a sort of an interesting point here, which I'm getting derailed already. But if you look at the release notes, you'll see that at version 0.21 there was a decision made to upgrade to 1.60 and actually in the most recent release oh, 21.3 they rolled back to zero or oh, sorry 1.48 and the reason why they did that was because this is what is packaged in debian stable <laughs> so arguably whatever the, the six week rolling release release cycle is not what where your users are at. Your users are sometimes much in much older rusts. <clears throat> Excuse me. Okay. Now we go, oh, we don't need to worry about release notes as much. The readme I also think is quite good because it includes a, a contribution guide and I'll try and bring this up on the side and increase the size a little bit. And We've got some really cool things. We've got benchmarks. We've got no standard support or no stud. There's a very high degree of rigor around performance, as you'll see once we look through the crate, which includes fuzzing as well. If you don't know what fuzzing is, stay tuned. I'll try and get to that as well. But essentially, the four second answer is that this crate expects to be able to be handed any data at all and not to crash. Uh, instead, a return an error. And we do that by what this process called fuzzing. So let's get going into the crate. A good place to start, I always find, is the example or the example code. In this case, the, the library has defined a base64 command line utility what i think might be useful would be to actually have some documentation for what this example actually provides in this case it, it provides a decoder and an encoder so if you could look at the you've got decode yes or no an alphabet which we can choose between standard and url safe as well as some file. And when the file isn't specified, it reads from standard in. And when it is, it. So this is actually fairly standard code. It's quite a little bit old. <clears throat> a struct opt is now no longer necessary. Instead, what you would tend to use would be something like the, the version 4 of the clap crate which provides a derive macro itself whereas struct opt is essentially a, a wrapper for an old version of clap and some of these other things are, are a little bit interesting just from like the rust code point of view so i have my options or my command line arguments and then i need to decide what to do with the input i box a trait object something that implements read and that might be standard in it might be some file reference if it's a hyphen or a dash uh, then still use standard in or alternatively if i wonder actually i'm just i sorry for tinkering with the code but 
We could also do that, I believe. Mm. And that might simplify the code ever so slightly. I wonder if this will build. So where am I? Let's go into Rust 64 and cargo build example base 64. I just eliminate a couple lines of code. Let's ignore that for now while it's compiling on the right. I've got this two, these two arguments. I can do standard URL save, and then I always specify a padding argument. So you can see that we're going through all of the arguments and then turning them into structured data. We always write to standard out. We don't specify, we don't allow our users to specify an out argument. <coughs> and then we could not compile unused import, expected an expression. Oh, sorry, I have a typo. Doesn't bind F. Ah, oh, interesting. Okay, so that means I'm wrong. You can't put num, none and sum, sum at the same time. Okay, so if I run this, oh, I need dash dash. Okay. The next thing to do is, so this is essentially how you read, how, it's a good way to ex, ex, see how you use this API. We have something that reads from some source. We then apply an alphabet or like we, we've got this engine thing, which we need to customize for our own use case. And then we apply some operation and in either encoding or decoding. And then we do the thing. In our case, we can actually use IO copy to copy data from the encoder to the source that we actually want, which is kind of a neat trick that we might think about later. I want to work from the outside in and talk about how the library is tested and how it's used. And then if we have time and <laughs> my voice doesn't give away, we will try to dig into the internals. I thoroughly recommend that you do this yourself anyway. So the first thing to do would be to like look at the benchmarks and we can see that we have quite a few about and this these mostly depend it looks like on things like whether or not do decode bench slice so is it reusing the buffer standard error resizing to zero i think it's trying to decide whether or not whether ugh, trying to decide whether or not the benchmark. So the bench. Sorry, I'm a bit confused because I'm trying. I'm trying to figure out what this is actually doing. Do decode bench under bench slice. So and decode slice is a an argument of that tries to decode some encoded base sixty four data into a buffer and do that repeatedly but i wonder why they resized the original buffer down to zero i suppose they would know this i mean it must have some so we, we're making so we're resizing it to zero and then truncating it presumably because the library wants to be very sure about the data that like it is being given mm. so we have like lots and lots of different types of variations on the types of things that we're trying to to optimize there are a couple of helper methods in our case we we have this fill function that takes some buffer a mutable reference to a, a vector of U8s and fills it up with random data, which is used extensively. But I'm still, I'm still confused by this pattern of so the V here is filled up. So this vector V is filled, and then with buff is 
what is actually used. So I'm, ah, okay, right. So we fill up at V, we have some random data because at 52, on a 53, we encode it. So encoded is base 64 encoding, is a base 64 encoding of some random data that is of size, size multiplied by three divided by four. I suppose that's intended to make sure that it's slightly out of the, that it's going to force a reallocation. I'm really confused by this, <laughs> but that's probably, that's just demonstrating that I have, uh, I'm sort of lacking a little bit of knowledge here. Okay. Sorry that this is getting quite boring quite quickly. The other thing that I wanted to show you, oh, we can actually, let's run, let's run these benches. So cargo bench, I hopeful, I'm hopeful that I don't like for seize my computer while I'm recording this. I guess we'll find out. <laughs> the compiler isn't so intensive, but that's because I've forced cargo to use fewer cores than, than it has available to it just so that I've got some cap compute capacity available for recording these sorts of streams. I want, what is a, okay. Criterion is the benchmarking crate, which provides a black box method, which from memory actually, so don't quote me on it, or at least go and verify, ensures that the optimizer, the Rust C optimizer, doesn't completely destroy or obliterate the actual call. So one of the problems that you encounter when you write benchmarks is that the optimizer thinks, ah, oh, a fast thing to do would actually to just ignore the call because it doesn't seem to do anything. These, the benchmarks that I'm doing now are likely to be very choppy because my computer is doing lots of work to record video streams and the audio stream from the microphone, but it seems here that each iteration takes about, well, I don't know, less than 100 nanoseconds. Oh, and here's one that just takes double that. And I wonder whether or not the library is essentially optimizing for the the use of memory and minimizing pressure on the memory allocator. So we have throughput of a, up to, you know, one gigabyte a second on there. There we go. One big one gigabyte a second for small inputs. And whether or not that's good or not probably depends. My little laptop here, it's not a very little laptop. It's a pretty decent one. <laughs> It's a Dell XPS 15. It should be hopefully, yeah, pretty good. I wonder if I should cancel now or if we should just let it run. Things to note, the Criterion library provides this warm-up step, which is trying to fill up things like caches and ensure that the performance of all of the the runs that you're actually testing is relatively consistent. You can see that I have these outliers uh, about, and I'm only doing 100 samples, or sorry, 100 measurements for each test, and about somewhere between three and six percent of them happen to have to be outliers. And that's probably due to the fact that I'm doing a lot of work. I want to push cancel. Ah, I wanted my nice pretty report from the benches that I was able to do. And, but you can do that yourself. If you really want to run through all of these benchmarks, I think it's extremely useful or extremely cool that base 64 is going to the length of uh, ensuring that the performance is as optimal as possible. Fuzz, fuzzes, uh, let's talk about fuzzing. 
<clears throat> fuzzing is a process by which we sort of hunt through the search space of all possible random values and we try and find examples that break the library <laughs> that we're using. Now, this is quite difficult to do because the search space is infinite and most things won't break the library. So you can run your fuzzes for as long as possible and over as, as long as you've got. It turns out that this actually happens. There is a, an open source project from Google, for example, that will constantly use compute time to fuzz open source libraries. Did I mean fix? No, I actually meant fuzz. Okay, so I need to cargo install cargo fuzz. I actually thought that I had that available on this computer. I'm surprised that it doesn't, but it's, it's not my cloud desktop. So I need to install that. So cargo fuzz is a cargo subcommand. It's independently maintained from cargo itself and it provides a fuzz command and I'm using invoking the nightly compiler and I'm going to run the, the round trip fuzz. So let's go look at the round trip fuzzer. So the round trip fuzzer is a process by which we take in some random data. We don't know what it is. We encode it and then we decode it and then we assert that the data that we started with is the same as the data that we ended up with. This is testing the fact that encoding the, the, the round trip process doesn't introduce any corruption irrespective of the data input that we actually end up providing. This is extremely CPU intensive. It will literally use all the data that you have. <laughs> and you can see here that the fuzzer is trying to be very, very sophisticated about how it's segmenting the search space to go and hunt for things that are very, very difficult. So for example, it might go and in certain null bytes where they're not expected, or it might then say, well, how would it know what, like we are in some, uh, how would the fuzzer know what, what is unexpected? Well, in this case, it doesn't. It's actually possible to precede the, a fuzzer with kind of some knowledge about the library that you are going and inspecting or interrogating. But in this case, it's actually got a whole bunch of rules that it's doing. Like it's inserting some, some, a null byte here, it looks like, and null bytes typically are not very well handled or lots of null bytes. And then I've got a, I've got, I've got two okay bytes. So things that, that might trip a fuzzer, uh, sorry, an encoder up would be delimiters that might be in the wrong place. Or in the case of base64, what about equal signs or are they in the right place or the wrong place? The handling of newline characters or other forms of white space. And your fuzzer will try as hard as it can to exploit or <laughs> all of the really nasty edge cases that the internet itself might be able to generate. And it will continue to, to go for as long as I'm willing to give it. Uh, we're not actually really discussing a lot about <laughs> May 64 right now. But you could imagine some examples. We just let this to run for, let's say, 12 hours while we are invocating. Uh, it looks like a couple, oh, like 4,000 executions per second. Oh, no, 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 here we go. That's the limit of the size. Execution is 15,000 and 25,000. So several millions of different examples. And I've just interrupted the, the process here. And you can see here what ends up happening is the fuzzer is creating binaries and other bits and pieces or other examples. In our case, it didn't find anything that broke. Turns out it's a good library. 
that's a shame. <laughs> we, we might be able to, we might be able to like tweak the library and just to show what actually might happen if we did break this, but let's, let's ignore that for right now and look at some more of the library. So I just went ahead. My brain was like, oh, you know, I should show some of the other things that this library is doing. One of the things that it needed to enforce, as we saw from the start, was this old Rust version. Most people are using Rust today, and today is just before the end of August, so it's the 29th of August here. I'm using, oh gosh, Rust 1.70, which is actually pretty old, and you know, it's easy. <laughs> already, but actually, it needs to be on, on Rust 148. Now, the so this is enforced at clippy.toml and in some other places as well. The Rust version here is is also described in the cargo.toml file as well. And what else do we have? Let's go to source. Let's actually go and dig into the code. It's been several minutes now. You've been bearing with me like you for like <laughs> let's say over 20 minutes again. Come on, McNamara, let's figure this out. And start with the outside. So We've got extensive documentation in the lib.rs file about how to use it. A good sign that someone has been very deliberate and very thoughtful with their library is to see whether or not they have tweaked the clippy lints and, for example, made something or promoted a few things that might be warnings and said, actually, in our project, we're going to deny them. Rust, sorry. And the, the base64 crate has actually denied warnings altogether. That is, if you deny a, this won't, the Rust will refuse to compile a project that has a, a deprecated, it like produces an error, sorry, produces a warning, which is a risk if you run this in CI. Because as soon as you deny warnings, you are kind of wedging yourself into a specific Rust version. And that's a problem if you want to stay current because warnings come and go and are more often than not, they come and then your code will no longer compile as your compiler automatically upgrades itself. So it's, I'm sort of on the fence as to whether or not denying warnings is actually a good thing. In the case, of this code because they are very strict with the with the version of Rust that they want to support. It's arguable that this is the right thing to do. I'm still not particularly convinced. I would like warnings to stay warnings. And if you think that they shouldn't be if you should be allowed, then like talk about that with the rest of the, the Rust project. So let's see if I can oh and then what is the difference between deny? and forbid well a deny would enable you to actually add an allow annotation inside your code to opt in to things that you don't really want at at, at the source code whereas forbid means that it's actually impossible for any part of your crate to kind of go around the rules. <laughs> and where is a part of this that I would like to show you? Mm. The, if we can find something that returns a result, it would be relatively easy to see the difference uh -huh. so decode returns a result which makes sense and if we uh, the thing about result is that it has annotated with with a annotation called must use and if we don't then rush should refuse to compile this however this is part of the public api so it's unlikely that the result here will actually do anything let me look deeper into the source code and the chunked encoder module provides a trait sync where so this is like a place where data is collected into that 
will return results as well. And what I want to find is references for this, but my Rust Analyzer isn't very happy at the moment. And so potentially it's taking a while to figure out how to actually be useful to me. The, what else can we see? String sync. Oh, so these are different implementations. See, I would have always put, so this is a test of our being able to chunk and code bits and pieces. But they've used a very boring thing here, foobar bears. You may as well always use like some fun, fun example in your code. Well, it's, interestingly, they don't have any other syncs. I would have expected to see something that looks a little bit like this whereby we could actually just use some arbitrary vector as a sync and that doesn't look like it's provided but maybe it's not so necessary the other thing and i'm just actually no that's completely unnecessary one of the whole points of utf8 is that it's by definition utf8 and oh, sorry one of the, the, the things about base64 is that by definition, it is ASCII encoded, which is also UTF-8 encoded. So there should be no need to go for VIC-Q8 because it's essentially redundant. There's no require, like there would be no need. You could possibly think that of like a box of U8 or which is some type like this. But this is really stretching it. I mean, this is essentially a fixed width type and actually box of U8 is not going to be enough either. I want like a box of a slice. But then you can't resize it and then you may as well just, at this point we may as well use string. Okay, decode. How are they doing the decoding? I have to say errors. So if you haven't just... If you are not sure about what an error is in Rust, a good way to remember it is that it is for reporting back to users what has gone wrong rather than having anything to do with the file system or it's only tangentially related to a result itself. So a error is really it's a good way to explain this are the good a really a, errors need to implement display that what is what an, essentially enables an error to be an error or an error type to be in to <laughs> implement error the invalid byte invalid length are sort of self-describing error codes that are useful to the people that are using the library but but aren't actually essential to the the, the code itself but so there's no you know, derive error that doesn't exist so i've got a decode thing here deprecated use engine decode aha uh -huh. so it's moving away from so the library has moved its api and it's doing that via deprecation annotations and so I need to go and find engine, which is in a separate module. And engines provide a way to encode and decode. Engine itself is a trait, which is a pretty reasonable thing to do. And although I argue that this kind of documentation is not really helpful since nobody will need to implement engine docs for internal methods are hidden hmm i kind of feel like that's not something you need to say <laughs> like we don't know as an author of a library like how people will make use of it but it's this is not meant to be called so you can see here that we've got an internal encode and in to and internal decoded length estimate 
So we've got kind of these, let's say, horrible, ugly methods as part of our trait, internal decode. It's arguable that the it's arguable that this trait is almost too big. I would I wonder whether or not if you did want to have an engine that you would just have like encode and decode using this type generic thing that sort of dispatches to other implementations, but I'm sure that they have a really good reason for doing what they're doing already. The code here as ref slice of U8 is an interesting argument to have. Typically, if I wanted to encode some data, I might say, oh, look, you know, what I really want is a slice of UT of 8. Oh, sorry, a slice of U8, which means some generator of, or something that is a slice of, of bytes. But what I am going to do instead is accept any type T that when you call as ref, it becomes a slice of U8. This provides like extra flexibility in terms of like what the actual input is going to be. It's also specified here down into inner. You might wonder, well, why on earth are they creating an inner function and calling that from encode? And that's because monomorphization of encode will dispatch to I need to start that again and that is because the the encode that is the outer side of this function will be call will be cop encode will be created as many times as needed to satisfy the, the generics but with this internal bit we will only ever have one copy. Now, in, because it, arguably it's not necessary to annotate with, say, in, inline never, it's just, but, sorry if I'm making no sense. What we're trying to do is give the code as much flexibility as possible to, in terms of being able to accept as many arguments as we can or argument types but we've got this problem and that is every new type generates code bloat and so wrapping encode we all we need to duplicate is this add as ref call whereas the inner function itself is not duplicated you could make this explicit by saying inline never but it's actually not really required because we haven't in annotated it with we haven't actually annotated the inner function with any inline attribute. Inlining works in Rust by assigning weights that are provided to to LLVM, and you can have always, or you could have uh, some. I think I don't actually remember which sum is. Maybe that's just inline and then there's never. Typically, if you, and, and LLVM doesn't actually, but like it doesn't actually trust you sometimes. So if you say, you know, always inline, it will just add a weighting to your, to the internal LLVM IR, but it's actually not guaranteed to in, always inline the code. If you look at the assembly, it might have decided because of some heuristic to essentially out overrule your hints as well. Okay. Um, so that's a cool trick. Uh, encode arbitrary octets as base 64 into a supplied string. Right, so this is a supply string. What's it? Encode string. So this is overloading string in some way. Oh no. This is similar to what we just had, but we're sending inf information directly out. Whereas previously, we created a brand new string based on some buffer. 
and which is pre-calculated. Now that's really interesting. Why didn't they just do, this is one of the things that I would be interested in. It's like, well, they've gone to the trouble to detect how much space to use. Encode with padding presumably has a, Encode with padding presumably has the problem, well not problem, but it probably only takes bytes, but I wonder if you could dispatch to expect invalid UTF-8. See, this should never happen. If your encoder is working correctly, you should never have invalid UTF-8. That kind of seems like a stupid error message, but maybe that's okay. It's really arguable to know if you, what you should do in cases where you always know that there's going to, like the, the, when, when you know that the error will never like, actually occur. I wonder if this is accurate. So what I'm doing here is I'm replacing the implementation of encode with padding with the streamed chunk encoder in every case. Now, I can rerun my benchmarks and see whether or not I could actually get away with reducing a whole bunch of code. Now the problem that I've got is I don't think I saved my, oh, okay, let's just, let's just fix the code. I've been given a thing here and I want to be able to. So the problem that I've got with, with my, with my benchmarks is I don't think I saved them properly, but, and I'm going to return out. Need to take a mutable reference to out. Kind of fascinating. The cool thing would be if you were able to do make a change like this and refactor the internals is that hopefully you get to remove a whole bunch of code. <laughs> now, it's very likely that I've replaced something that's fast with something that's really sl or slower. Presumably, otherwise I would have always done chunked encoder. I, I, there's probably also a problem with the padding. Ah. Okay, cool. So even though I did a, oh, interesting. Okay, so this is a fascinating change. It's hard to know like which is faster and which is not. There have been some improvements. And like in many of the cases, but also really wild changes as well in other cases. Hmm. So, you, okay, let's go check where Criterion is actually storing all of this data, because I think it's useful to know. In benches, there is, oh, actually, we're maybe in target. Criterion, we encode. We've got a bunch of extra data that Criterion was using. And we've got confidence intervals, and, and so it, it can try and detect whether or not it's a statistically significant change. And likewise, and the, the one that's changing here is the reuse buffer. But yeah, I just, I just, I'm whenever I see code duplicated, I'm like, well, should this change? And I don't like. This is just me personally. You should never tell a user. You could just imagine imagine being a user and getting, and I'm just getting irritated with this. So previously, string from UTF-8, expect invalid UTF-8. Your library should never generate invalid UTF-8. This should never be a, a sensible thing to do. Instead, I would, I would do this. Oh, unchecked actually is what it is. Now, this is going to anger a lot of people if you're still watching this, this stream. Because I would say that the right thing to do now is actually wrap this in unsafe and just say, this is UTF-8. We know it is. We built it. We control everything here. So this is actually a safe operation. But the library has forbidden unsafe in its definition and so isn't able to make use of something 
like this. There is an alternative, which I don't know what the impact of. Oh gosh. If it's not obvious, so what I'm trying to do is tell the compiler this will never ever fail. And OK is this is almost like. So what we're trying to do is we've been we've forbidden unsafe. But you could still do something like this, which is kind of horrific, but it does avoid unsafety. Now our performance improvements and some of them have been totally dwarfed by a lot of regressions. So obviously the stream encoder is a different type of algorithm, which is actually slower. And so the so the library authors have almost certainly made the right decision. Now I just want to try one other change, which is to see whether or not I, so where's the original? Let's go back to the original code. Oh, whoa, 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 whoa. What's happened here? What? Oh my goodness. I'm going to just get restore, I think. Might, and just go away. Don't save that and come back to it. This is my chunked encoder, and but what we were trying to do was replace this encode thing. I want to check what is the performance implications of having a an error here that we should never ever encounter. And first, I'll just verify that this will fail. We're forbidden unsafe. So this should refuse to compile. Uh, usage of an unsafe block. This is an error. We've got forbid unsafe code. Okay. Now let's get rid of that. It's like, wow, well, that's just, that's, that's not important to me. Safety isn't an important thing to do. Like, can we build it? Oh, yep. Now we can still build it. And now we're going to run our benchmarks. Presumably, I should have probably rerun the benchmarks based on the bench, on like the standard case. It's, but it is really, it's complicated to, oh, we're running all the tests. So that we ex kind of expected that this would all go back to normal. I might have to go and run all of these again with the, with the new code. <clears throat> well, sorry, with the original code, because this is actually testing against the last change. Let's see if I can skip a whole bunch of work here by cancelling and going back to my unsafety and, well, which, you know, I should be you know, quite arguably, this is an awful thing to do. It's like, no, 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 no. And hopefully we now see some tiny, there should be very, very little change because what we want Rust to do is for this expect method to have almost negligible performance impact. It's really, interestingly, it's still a really jumpy. And that is probably to do with the fact that I'm on the stream here. I'm using the network very heavily. I'm spending a whole bunch of time. And this is all very, very difficult to interpret. And it's also because I'm not very familiar with the library itself. I don't know whether or not I'm hitting the critical path. I, for example, am not sure about encoding strings, encodes. Like, is it really the case that ex running expect on string from UTF-8 has really increased the time it takes by 
nearly 30%? I don't know. I'm very, very confused. <laughs> okay, I'm going to hang up the stream now. If you are still watching, I highly recommend subscribing because you are a dedicated, dedicated fan. And this is a very, very, this is definitely an experiment. So give me some feedback and some comments and give me suggestions for other crates. If this is your crate, I, and I, and I want to just bring a very, very small shout out to Alice and Marshall here for creating a phenomenal part of the Rust ecosystem. This is a real testimony to your dedication over your, oh look, there's even a note for a clap for, which I touched on right at the start. Like This is a huge part of the Rust ecosystem. And thank you very much for thinking about your friends over in Debian land who need Rust 148. And it's just a, just a very, very big thank you to all of the maintainers of the crate and all of open source because it's very thankless. And so my job just hopefully is to provide a tiny bit of thanks for you. So thanks, Marshall. Thanks, Alice. Thanks everyone watching the video. Hopefully this has been fun. You've learned a little bit about fuzzing. You've learned a little bit about, about benchmarking and a little bit about some nice, neat features of Rust. Okay, cheers. Take care. Bye.